Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for today's Mobile Cause webinar, Countdown to Your Best Year-End Giving Campaign. I'm Scott Couchman. I'm the training manager here at Mobile Cause. And today, we, we know that, we all know that the end of the year is an important time for fundraising. And although December may feel like a world away, Today's webinar is going to help you get a jump on reaching this year's ambitious goals with 10 of the most powerful ways to optimize your year-end campaign. We'll take a look at everything from why year-end giving should still be a prominent component of any nonprofit fundraising plan and how to mobilize your team to building an effective year-end communications calendar and deploying the perfect multi-channel approach that'll help you reach new and loyal donors and inspire more giving. So put on your virtual party hat and grab your pen and paper. This is gonna be a fun and informative discussion to, to kick off your year-end fundraising. And we welcome your participation in our presentation today. So please feel free to ask any questions about year-end giving by submitting them in the questions box on, box on your go-to uh, webinar control panel. We'll answer questions directly to participants during the webinar and at the end when we have an open Q&A session with our experts. Uh, now, we hope you enjoy today's webinar. And as a quick reminder, we will be sending out the recording and slides to all our registrants afterwards. Now, today's webinar is presented by MobileCause. MobileCause understands the everyday challenges nonprofits face, constantly confronted with limited resource resources, yet still expected to expand your impact. You shouldn't have to face those challenges alone, and that's why MobileCause offers more than comprehensive fundraising software. We also provide one-on-one -on -one strategy from dedicated fundraising experts with the industry's best support team all ready to guide you to succeed 24 seven. And if you're struggling to find the time to run or even create your campaign, our digital fundraising services are available as an extension of your team to work with you on each component of your fundraiser. At MobileCause, we're just as committed to your cause as you are and together we can grow your nonprofit like never before. Now, let me introduce you to our presenters, both fundraising experts. Pamela Grow is the publisher of the Grow Report, the author of Simple Development Systems, and the founder of Basics and More Fundraising Fundamentals Online Training. Pam has been helping small nonprofits raise dramatically more money for over 18 years and was named one of the 50 most influential fundraisers by Civil Society. Civil Society Magazine, and one of America's top 25 fundraising experts published by Philanthropy Media and Michael Chapman Network. Her blog, PamelaGrow.com, was named one of the 25 must-read nonprofit IT blogs of 2016. Now, Corey Blake is a fun digital fundraising strategist at MobileCause. Corey works one-on-one -on -one with nonprofits of all sizes to help maximize their success on fundraising campaigns. From consulting, strategy, and best practices to the creation of campaign communications across text messages, social media, and email, Corey's expertise has helped drive donations and donor engagement for nonprofits to grow their mission and achieve their goals. Now, today we have a really informative agenda for you, packed with helpful insights and takeaways, where our speakers are going to cover uh, these topics here. Why is year-end fundraising so important? Warming up your donors, planning out your email and direct mail, telling your authentic story, and tailoring and calendaring your communications. All right, so before we begin our countdown to your best year and giving campaign, we do have a quick poll question for you. Does your nonprofit currently plan for year-end fundraising? Yes, no, or well, kind of, sort of. So let me open up the poll here and let's see what answers we get. And launch here. There we go, it should be on screen. So go ahead and answer that. Let's see what we kind of have here. All right, getting some good answers. Hmm. 
good participation. Get a lot, a lot of folks here. We got. We'll give it another few seconds here. Got a lot of uh, interesting. Nice. I like the the responses. All right, things are slowing down now. So we'll go ahead and close out the poll and let's take a look at those numbers. So let's take a look here. So uh, what it looks like is that, uh, you know, does your uh, nonprofit currently have a plan? 45% uh, yes, great, that's fantastic. 44% um, kinda sorta, that's, that's, that, that's good, you're thinking about it. And no, so all of these are great. These are, uh, you know, this, this is good information to show here. Um, you know, for those of you with yes, hopefully we'll, you'll get some new ideas to, to make it even better for those kinda sorta, maybe this will give you some plans. And those for no, hey, guess what? This is, this is great, you can have a, a nice uh, plan from today's session. So a lot of great information here. And uh, so wh whatever state you're in, you should have some good tips here. So let's get into it. Uh, if you want to uh, let me hide these results here, get back over to our presentation. If you want to join me in welcoming Pamela Grow to start us off with why year-end fundraising is so important, I'll pass it over to Pamela now, and uh, it's all yours, Pamela. Well, thank you, Scott, and thank you to everybody at, at Mobile Cause and. Thanks for the terrific introduction, and thanks to, to all of you for being here, for, for taking the time out of your busy day to be here today. I am really super excited to be sharing some of the ways that our students have really rocked their year-end campaigns. And, um, well, let's get started. So why is year-end fundraising so important? Really, very simply, it's when our donors give most generously. Even though I, I teach like systems in our trainings for how to be raising money year round, a lot of donors only give at the year end. And if we take a look at the numbers, you can see that that's true. 30% of annual giving occurs in December. 28%, almost 30% of nonprofits raise between 26 and 50% of their annual funds from their year-end ask. 12% of annual giving occurs on the last three days of the year. And take a look at this. 54% of nonprofits start planning their year-end appeal in October. We actually start in um, late August. 60% of nonprofits make between one and three touches for their year-end campaign, which is actually kind of low. 45% of nonprofits don't have a digital strategy. These numbers are actually from, uh, from 2018, and I'd be really curious to learn if that particular number had changed at all. There we go. How do people give? This was a really interesting statistic for me because volunteers are twice as likely to donate as non-volunteer supporters. I don't know if you guys are surprised by that, but I know a lot of organizations don't, I've worked for organizations that don't solicit their volunteers because their thinking is, but they already do so much. And that's really a wrong way to think because your donors already have a super, super high commitment level to you. And as long as you're regularly letting them know how much you appreciate them and their good work and you actually create a special ask that's just for them, you should be asking. You always want to remember that you're, you're not begging, you're really offering kind of a rare and precious opportunity to create change. And this statistic kind of surprised me a little bit too. Two thirds of donors don't do any research before giving. You know, we put a lot of weight on our Charity Navigator ratings, but I know that I've personally never, never, uh, checked out an organization that I've been about to donate to using Charity Navigator. 
And this is a great one too. 55% of people who engage with nonprofits on social media end up taking some sort of action. So how many of you, I wonder if we could just see a show in the, um, in the chat box, how many of you are able to get your board members and your other staff members involved in year-end fundraising? I don't know if I can see the chat box. Do we have any answers? Yeah, we're, we're getting some uh, coming in here. Um, yeah, it looks like a lot, of, uh, a lot of people are showing yes, they do. Excellent, excellent. This is a little tool that I put together for you guys, and it's it's called your fundraising menu. And this is a fun little tool that gives you really easy, easy tasks for your board members, for your volunteers, for for staff members that they can do. And what, what we typically do is to have them pick one appetizer, one main course, and one dessert. And there's something is something as simple as just writing a thank you note, addressing envelopes, especially for smaller nonprofits. If you do the hand addressed envelopes, you'll have a higher guarantee of, of getting your direct mail letter read. Um, making connections, making introductions, it's just a real, real fun little tool. So I hope you'll put that to work. So let's start the countdown. And we are going to start with one of my very, very, very favorite tactics. And if if you're not familiar with Robert Cialdini, he is the author of Influence: The Psychology of Persuasion. And that's one of those one of those books that I actually make it a point to re reread every like every year or so because it's really so important to our work. Um, He's also got a newer book called Presuasion, Channeling Attention for Change, and that's another must read. And that's kind of where this idea of warming up your donors came from. And really, it's a question of priming your donors for your year-end ask. And why would you want to do that? Well, it makes people feel important. It makes people feel appreciated. It makes people feel selfishly fulfilled. And who doesn't want to feel more important, appreciated, and fulfilled? And wouldn't you be more generous if you did? So how? what does that look like? It's a warm-up piece just kind of reminds your donor of why they gave in the first place, and it thanks them again a lot. And you can do it with an impact report, which is pretty much kind of like an abbreviated annual report, but you usually are gonna do it in an infographic style and just make it a one pager. You can do a thank you letter for no specific, uh, no specific gift, just a kind of a thank you for no reason. Like this example here, you can think about having your board members engage in a thankathon before your appeal. You could do a thank you postcard, you could do an email, you could even do a combination of these methods, which is what I usually do with clients. We usually we usually have a mix of, um, of uh, donors and so we'll do a letter, we'll do something something via direct mail and then an email as well. And the important thing is that your warm-up piece goes out probably two to three weeks in advance of your actual ask. So we're still talking about really preliminary stuff here. The success of your campaign is really gonna hinge on your data. So you're gonna, you're gonna really wanna do a thorough, you're gonna thoroughly analyze your data. You wanna know how you did last year overall. Then you're gonna to wanna to know how you did by segment. And that includes all your donors, your monthly donors, your mid-level donors, your, your major donors. What channels did you use last year? What does your renewal rate look like? What is your donor retention rate? What is your breakdown at various giving levels? You know, how many gifts do you have in the in the zero in the in the 
five to twenty five dollar range and the twenty five to fifty dollar range that kind of thing when you're reviewing your data review it with an eye to segmentation how you're going to be how you're going to be segmenting your donor database and you really might want to consider a data audit especially if you've been around for a while and and you haven't looked at your you haven't looked at your your data thoroughly for a while maybe maybe you've been around for you know 10 15 20 years when you have your data audited you're going to find out what names have no addresses or bad addresses what names have no email addresses what names have no phone numbers what names have invalid zip codes that kind of thing so consider consider a professional data audit so we're going to move on to direct mail we're going to talk a little bit about direct mail and why direct mail why are we going to be talking about direct mail now well it isn't sexy but it works and it works with generation x it works with millennials millennials actually love direct mail but more importantly donors age 65 and older comprise by far the largest slice of the american charity pie that's actually from Tom Hearn's latest book, but you've probably seen it yourself in your own in your own um, donor databases. And the highest performing direct mail is more than a letter. When um, when you're creating your organization's direct mail ask, I want you to really think in terms of a packet, not a letter. How does it all work together? And what do you want your donor to do? I mean, I know you want your donor to give, but you kind of have to lead them there every step of the way. You know how in, in online fundraising, we really emphasize email subject lines? Well, in direct mail, there's you really want to give a lot of thought to your envelope. I always think I started writing direct mail, gosh, about, it's been about 18 years ago. And when I first started writing direct mail, back then my kids were little and I'd always think about how I opened my own mail. And I opened it over the trash, essentially. So how is your envelope going to entice someone to open that letter, to open your letter? One of my favorite methods is, is the one you can actually see right here, which is a great little teaser with the be the change, but also, um, this one's from Agents of Good, which is a Canadian direct response company. And they typically are using this oversized envelope, which is what I have been using lately with clients. And I really like it. It does stand out. And then there's the letter itself. Take a look at these, these letters here. And remember that your best owners are 65 and older, the ones that are giving the most. Are you making the letter really easy for your donor to read, like these examples? I've had letters come through that were in 10-point font, and then I've had letters come in that, that were in a nice 14-point font. And we could go into really serious detail on, on some other aspects, like, for instance, the, the indents there on the paragraph, which nobody ever wants to do, but there's a reason for that all the white space in the letter and then going on to the um teeny tiny tiny little reply envelopes that's with with these forms that's almost impossible to fill out with a magnifying glass think in terms of your older donors uh, more and more i'm seeing these full page response devices they're very 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 easy to complete and what else? You might think of including some sort of lift of some kind, an extra little insert in your letter. It might be an extra letter. It might be an, actually an engagement piece, which I'm seeing a lot of lately, and I've done that for a couple of clients where you might include, um, oh, for instance, one charity that I saw, they included these, these um, like Christmas tree ornaments, but they were... Um, like cardboard 
and you could write a note to their to their uh, clients on the back of the ornament and send it back something like that where you're actually actually ask, uh, excuse me you're actually requesting um, um, non-financial engagement might be an extra letter or a note signed by a local celebrity or even a donor or a handwritten sticky note from board members this is a this is a good tactic too is to poll your board members to find out which board members know which donors and bring them in early to write some notes on the letter or even a printed sticky note like this one something that just gives a little added lift to your packet and once you've got your letter underway, you're going to start planning out your email series to really complement that letter. And we typically recommend, just generally speaking, a minimum of three to seven emails. But a lot of organizations, and you've probably seen this yourself, send out a lot more. But your email series, it's going to really reinforce your entire campaign. And I love this checklist. This is from Next After. Is the message going to the right audience? How are you segmenting? Is the offer relevant to the issues that matter to them? Does the offer resonate with this audience? Are you maximizing the perceived value of offer and minimizing the perceived cost? Are you giving proper incentive to take action now? Sometimes that can be a tricky one. Is it, are you making it very, very, very simple for the donors to give? This is something you kind of want to, you want to review and you want to test every time you have a new campaign. At least four times a year, you really want to test your donation processes. Is the call to action clear? Do your donors believe you are trustworthy and the giving process is secure? Next After has some really interesting studies on that where they showed that just putting a little graphic padlock example next to the, or right on the donation form, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was really stunning how much it increased gifts. The more emphatic the yes to each of these, the more emails you can send. And then I think this is actually my last tip, but this is a good one. Show extra love for your best donors. This is a tactic that's really guaranteed to ramp up your results, especially if you are a smaller organization, but I've seen it used in larger organizations as well. And it was shared with our students when um, Denisa Casement, she's a consultant who works primarily with smaller nonprofits, she presented on this. And it's simply this, that you show extra love to your very, very best donors. Because 20% of your donors typically make up 80% of your income. So how exactly does this work? Let's see it in action here. This is, this is from um, Julie of the Humane Society of Northeast Georgia. She used these tactics last year. She was in our program. Normally, their mailing goes out through their mail house and every donor gets essentially the same letter. But in 2018, I guess this was, yeah, 2018, she segmented out her organization's top donors and she sent them a special pack in-house. And here's exactly what they did. They had, a, they had a local artist who did rescue themed paintings. So she, she had them turned into these little wooden plaques. See that right in the center? for the donors who gave a thousand and plus in the past year. And she wrote, she said, it's the first year we've done any donor gifts, so it's going to be interesting to see what kind of response we get. And then let's see, she did the stars to the donors giving between a hundred and and nine hundred and ninety nine dollars during during the year. So what happened when she did this increased segmentation and extra love? They actually raised 84% more than the previous year. I thought this was so cool. And I think it's definitely worth the extra time and trouble. They did it all. They did all of this part in-house. 
great envelopes too. Oh, we're halfway through the countdown. All right. Well, thank you, Pamela, for all of the uh, the the great ideas on uh, on year and giving campaigns. A uh, lot a lot of good information here. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, check out the chat. We do have a link to uh, to download uh, and get the the menu and checklist. We'll also uh, mention it again at the end and also be in, in the follow up email. But uh, again, yeah, thank you for the great stuff here. And as a quick reminder, if you do have any questions, you can submit them into the question box uh, on your control panel as we go along and now let me get control here and I'll give it over to Corey uh, who will uh, keep the uh, year-end giving countdown co going here so Corey uh, you should have control over to thank you. Thank you so much thank you Scott and thank you Pamela for such great information so uh, yeah, looking, moving on to our countdown. I hope you have your uh, your party hats ready and your your noisemakers. Uh, we'll we'll we're making our way to number five here. So uh, next is number five on our countdown. So as five is to tell your authentic story. So we're we're very big on storytelling, and there, there's many good causes and organizations to give uh, to. So so people obviously have a lot to choose from. So they're ultimately going to decide to give to yours because they are moved to do so. Um, storytelling is one of the most powerful ways to move someone. Uh, and, and I love this quote here that we have from the founder of Pixar, which of course is a company renowned for its very clear and effective storytelling. Uh, I like to look at it as talking to somebody's heart versus talking to their brain. And uh, this graphic shows on the left common messages organizations want to share, but ultimately they're not talking to the heart of their mission. And ultimately they're not talking to that donor's heart. And on the right is how you could turn that messaging into something of value and something that will move them. So it may sound strange, but we really encourage you to think about this sort of storytelling approach as if you're making a Hollywood movie. Uh, there's a reason these movies make a lot of money. Uh, humans are drawn to stories. Uh, we are moved by the experience of these stories. And, and so they generate a lot of money. And so you can do the same by effectively telling your story. Who are your main characters? Uh, these are the beneficiaries of your organization. What are their obstacles? And how does your organization help your characters move to the third act and find a happy ending? Your donors get to be the hero in this scenario. They get to make these happy endings possible. And you really want to drive this, this, this idea home with them. We have, there's a link here. We have an infographic available that talks more about this approach. And I recommend checking that out. So we'll be sending all this material, as Scott mentioned, to you later today. And you'll be able to use that link and download that infographic. Uh, but this kind of approach, this really, you know, building a narrative of the work that your organization does, whenever possible, I always recommend attaching it to a person. So whatever your mission, even if it is not directly related to a person, a person is impacted by it invariably. And so start there, tell their story and how their involvement with something you've built or something you've provided has helped them. Uh, that's going to really move people because they're going to be attached to someone else's story. So uh, and once we've moved your audience to become donors uh, or ideally to give again if they've given before, uh, then what? We want to make sure they have the easiest time giving. So when they've decided, yeah, I'm going to make a donation, we want them to just have it be real smooth. So when you post your story, you want to make sure you're clear to, your, your call to action is very clear. They, you want to, they want to know exactly how to help. So every once in a while I'll see you an organization and they'll be a little bit vague. You know, they'll say to show your support or to help us out. And that's good, but you want to really zoom in on how, you know, specifically ask them to make a donation, make a gift. Also keep in mind that some people may think about it and decide to give later. You know, they saw your post, they saw your stories. And uh, sometimes, you know, people have to think about it or they're busy and they go back to it and say, I'll do that when I get home. You know, maybe they want to talk to a spouse. You know, there's all these sorts of reasons why they may decide to take that action later. And so the direct link you provide in your call to action 
they may not be used. Most often it will be, but you want to be ready for the scenario of somebody saying, all right, uh, I go, I, I'm home now, I'm going to go to their website, and I want to just make a donation. And so they may do that. They may just go to your website, look for a way to donate. You want to make sure there is a clear and easy way to catch them. Uh, a large, colorful donate button should be prominent on your website. So you see on the top right, which I like that placement of that top right. Um, there's a lot of studies in graphic design about how the eyeball moves around the screen, and so that's a really good place. Um, make the donation form once you know they click on the button they're going to see a form ideally that should be the first thing they see after clicking that button and that form should be as short as possible the less fields there are for the donor to even consider filling out the better the higher the fulfillment rate uh, the longer the form even if there are fields that are optional some sometimes organizations they want to just have things there just in case they can capture it it's a balance. You know, you want to have good donor data, but you also don't want them to drop out. And as you can see, these abandonment rates can be over half of the people that are landing on your form may leave. And so you don't want to give them any excuse for second guessing what they're doing. Uh, you know, maybe they'll get pulled away by something, you know, and that you, you want to minimize that, make it as fast as possible. Of course, make sure your website and donation form are both optimized to be mobile so whatever screen whatever device they're on they should be able to have an easy time to give uh, as you can see 84 percent of nonprofits still don't have forms that are optimized for mobile and that's uh you know half of internet traffic is on mobile so you want to make sure you're not leaving out half of your potential donors all right number Continuing on number four here, uh, conf uh, confirm the online giving experience. So if you're linking your call to action uh, to a donation form, that's ideal. And that form that they land on, it should be branded to that campaign. So as you can see on this form on the right here, you know, you've got a picture with a kid, you got some copy there under the picture that should all be tied to what that storytelling was doing that led them here. Um, then once you've got the form designed here, you want to do a test transaction. Any form you set up, you should always do a test transaction. And this, this kind of surprises me. So, uh, organizations we work with, sometimes they'll set up a form and then they just throw it out into the wild, you know, and, and they haven't checked it. And you want to make sure that the donor experience is going to be what you want it to be from start to finish. You want to make sure that a transaction can even happen. So just to see, yep, the money went through, you really want to make sure that functionally it is going to accept money. Uh, and you also want to make sure that the receipt that they get via email, any text confirmations, that confirmation page they get, that landing page, that thank you page they get right after they click that donate button, all that language that they see, you want to make sure that it's what you want it to be. And the more it can be tied to that campaign again and reinforce the storytelling that you're doing, the better. So the more custom it can be to that campaign, the better. So once your forms are in place, you'll want to look at a the best way to get them there. So we want to really look at crafting a message and a call to action that appeals to different segments. So Pamela kind of touched on segmenting a little bit, and so we want to dig in a little bit more on this. Uh, you want to have your donors feel that the, the, what they're getting is most relevant to them. So break your master list of donors into three to five groups. How you divide them is going to be up to you. What you decide is your, are your objectives. So, for example, maybe you want to convert one-time givers into recurring donors uh, and recurring donors into recurring donors at a higher level. Or maybe you want to try to engage those that have only ever given once to your organization. Or maybe you want to try to increase giving levels so that people end up giving more than they have in the past. Whatever, whatever kind of metric you're looking for, have an objective. Have like, okay, well, we're reaching out to these people. You may want to look at their history of giving and you may want to see, okay, where can we improve this? And that may lead you into that, into segmenting. Um, also, as, as Pamela mentioned, like those high value donors, you want to treat them a little bit different. So put them on their own segment and give them messaging that really speaks to their commitment to your organization and, and how they can help more and kind of bring it to that next level. 
So uh, once you decide how you're going to break up your donors, you'll want to tailor your messaging for each group and send them to a donation page that is most relevant to them, to that group, and what you want them to do. So for example, if you're trying to convert one-time donors into recurring donors, have the donation form default to a recurring frequency. So they land there and already it's set to monthly or maybe annually. Uh, and if they try to give a one-time gift, have a pop-up window that comes up and reminds them of the value of being a recurring donor and suggests a comfortable recurring level based on the one-time gift they were about to make. Um, usually about 60% of that. So, you know, if I give $100, maybe a pop-up comes up and says, hey, you know, by, recur by being a recurring giver, you're, you're going to sustain our organization over a longer period of time. Would you like to give $60? Something like that. Um, just to interact with them so that the messaging that you sent them to this form, if that was about recurring, it's all going to make sense. It's all going to feel cohesive. All right, so next you'll want to figure out when you're talking to your donors. So once you figure out, okay, this is what we're saying, this is who we're saying it to, what's what's the rhythm of this? You know, what? how are we going to stagger this language? So create a campaign calendar that integrates across multiple channels. People are going to hear from you in a number of ways, and everybody is going to have their own preference about how they hear from you. Ideally, it's at least two channels. You know, maybe it's text and maybe it's Facebook. Maybe it's email and Twitter. You know, whatever combination. Maybe it's direct mail and you know phone calls. You know, if you're doing a tele uh, like a telephone kind of idea, um, you'll want to plan your communication knowing that people may be hearing from you across these channels. They may they may follow you on multiple social media channels. So the more you're able to nudge them across these different channels, the better. And of course, working out this flow here will also help you in organizing your workflow. So you know, okay, great. In one month, I wanna be able to make sure I have all my videos in place for my storytelling. So this, this uh, calendar we have uh, in the handouts box here in your GoToWebinar control panel, so you can access that there. Um, you'll also be able to get it when we send it to you afterward, after the, uh, the webinar, we'll, we'll follow up with you with all this material. Uh, you'll also want to look at uh, talking to your donors early. Um, so sometimes people think like, well, I'm just going to send out on New Year's Eve and that's it. Um, you want to make sure that by the time they get that New Year's Eve ask, that should be the culmination of your communication they've been getting already. So just as a Hollywood movie, it builds to that climax in the third act. Your message should be the same way your messaging should be the same way and it should build with a higher frequency towards the end to reinforce the urgency and the need so by the time they get to new year's eve they realize i have to take action now because if i don't the outcome i want to have happen isn't going to happen isn't going to happen so uh, you can pre-schedule your messages as well so you don't have to <laughs> sit there and, and you know with your finger hovering over the the you know the trigger there uh you can pre-schedule all your messaging and that way you can focus on monitoring your activity, seeing the donations come in, and you can also respond to comments on social media. You can respond to any questions from donors. You wanna be able to be nimble on the day of and be able to respond and interact, and that's gonna just help fostering this dialogue and this conversation that is involving, that is, that is including donating. Okay, so the very last part here, number one, uh, the confetti is about to, to drop from the ceiling, so prepare yourselves. Uh, one of the most important is the thank you. Uh, this is this cannot be overstated. So many organizations let this drop, and they are effectively dropping their donors at the same time. So you can see 90% of first-time donors are being lost by some nonprofits on an annual basis. 59% drop off the radar each year. So that communication after the campaign is so vital. Strive to send out a follow-up message after the campaign ends within 48 hours. Now, ideally, you, you're going to have uh, automated thank yous that are triggered immediately from donating. So they click that donate button, they get a thank you page, they get an email, they get a text. All that language is customized like we were talking about earlier. And so right away, they get a thank you. But you also want to afterward follow up and say, this is how it all went. This is how much money we raised. This is the difference you've helped make possible. Uh, this 
is really helping to engage them. It's all part of your storytelling. So just like an epilogue scene of a movie, you know, just once once the big climactic finish happens, there's always that sort of epilogue scene of this is how it all worked out in the end, and, and people want to know how it ends. So this all continues that conversation, and you're also priming those donors to hear from you more, so that when you start to reach out to them again later, they're they're ready. It's not it's not like oh did I was that that organization I gave to? You know, it's you, you're continuing this narrative that should have an ebb and flow. They shouldn't hear from you after this campaign and then not hear from you again for another year. So be, be creative with your, your thank you messages as well. So right after someone gives, like I said, there's that initial content that they will get. Uh, you can have that confirmation page redirect to a web page or some kind of content. It can be a video. Um, I, I, I think videos are super engaging. There's a lot of study about humans interact visually more than just words on a page. So visuals and especially moving pictures, uh, it's again, why Hollywood movies are so so effective. Human eye is drawn to that flickering light, essentially, if you really wanna drill into the science of it. And so having a thank you video with a message from a family that your organization helped or from the executive director or maybe a volunteer, something like that, it does not have to be long, it can be, five to 10 seconds is plenty just to get across that gratitude. And later on, you can spotlight a donor, uh, why they gave, or you can look at an active volunteer uh, and how they were moved to become so involved in your organization. All of these are potential stories that you can use even after the campaign, like, like for these thank you messaging. Um, you can tag donors on social media. And that could be something you ask permission for on the form. I've seen some organizations do that. Uh, and you can also do live streams. Those are fantastic. Really using Facebook and Instagram stories and things like that, all this technology to your to, to the best uh, of your abilities here and making it really interactive. And this, this is it's a celebration. This kind of celebration is really rewarding for donors because it lets them feel the victory too. And they just are now a part of your organization's journey. So using all of these elements of this countdown, all these things that we've talked about, it's it's fun and exciting to be a part of a campaign like this. It's really taking advantage of all the potential opportunities. I've worked with hundreds of organizations as a digital fundraising strategist, and I see these tools and how they can work every day. Uh, it's great. I, I help craft the storytelling for year-end appeals. I build the campaign calendar. I draft language for telling that story across social media, email, and text. And I set up the donation forms following best practices that we've learned from the years we've been we've been doing this. Uh, and it's all it's it's fun. It's exciting. It's so gratifying to see it all work out and see donors respond to it. You know, there's a reason why we repeat these things is because we see it consistently work. So I would definitely recommend that, you know, utilize as much of this as you can. When all these pieces come together, it really can feel like that sort of New Year's celebration. So don't be afraid to dive in and adopt these tips. So with that, I will turn it over to Scott. And thank you so much. Hi, thanks, Corey, and thank you, Pamela and Corey, both for sharing these great tips and, and your expertise with us today. So we really hope everyone here is inspired to, to get that jump start on their best year-end giving campaign ever and, and test out these great strategies for, for bringing in donations and building impact well beyond the new year. Now, before we go ahead and jump into our Q&A, we just want to ask a real quick question here. So let me open up the poll again. Uh, so, would you do you like what you heard? Would you like more information? Uh, go ahead and click in there. We'll just give this a few seconds. All right, pull this open, and we'll let that run. All right, got it. Getting a good group in here. Okay, Th thank you for your answers. So, with that, let's. Get back in here. So for uh, for our questions here, uh, our first question is for Pamela. Um, 
the uh, question is, what is the most effective method for year-end fundraising, for making the highest and best contact with donors? Is it mail, email, phone calls, all three, or something else? I would really say all three, but you know that it always depends. You know, some organizations may have raised most of their most of their money through um, digital. Maybe they've never even done direct mail. So then I would say, I would say focus in on your digital. But typically, typically where where our people raise the most is with a combination of all three. Okay, great, great. Okay, and, uh, and before we, uh, uh, next question here, just want to mention that MobCause will be sending uh, year-end appeal templates out next week, uh, pre-crafted year-end messages for email, letters, social media, text messages. Hey, you can help out with that. Oh, All very right. cool. So, uh, next question here is for Corey. Let me see here. Uh, how frequent do you recommend we post when boosting our messages at the end of end of the year, um, I would you know, again. I think it depends on what you're doing on social media already. Um, but I would say you know at least three. But I think the day of that ask, you should be you know basically you're you're doing sort of like a live update you know so there's nothing wrong with posting multiple times a day throughout the day saying how we're doing reinforcing that storytelling things like that if you're talking about boosting as in like facebook boost like you know paying for a boosted post um uh you know i'm i'm a little bit torn about those if they're so if they're if you boost a post basically who's going to see that is probably going to be people who are not familiar with your organization and expecting them to donate from their uh, just one post uh is is not generally likely you know it, it usually takes multiple touches until somebody actually gives which i, I, think, I think pamela mentioned that earlier and so um a boost you know you want to i would recommend actually probably boosting posts in advance of the day of giving to try and bring people into your page try and get them to like it and become engaged then when you do the ask they're already in your page you know getting your page's content um, that i think has more potential value rather than just boosting a post out of the blue uh, asking somebody to donate who doesn't know the work you do um you know there also and again, you know, thinking sort of ahead of it, Giving Tuesday is obviously a big day. We were we've been talking about year end. Obviously, this is the point of the point of the webinar. But Giving Tuesday, you know, we can't pretend that that's not happening, and it's happening a little bit later than it does normally. So, you know, that's another factor to consider is as sort of a end of year campaign is how does Giving Tuesday play with that, and how does my social media strategy work with that. Uh, so you don't want to kind of inundate them with emails and social media if if you're sending things out giving tuesday and then end of year you know at least have a, a break or again looking back at that segmenting if you're sending that those asks out to different groups which there's data to show that those that participate in giving tuesday aren't always the same people that, that contribute on new year's so there's a lot of factors to kind of consider and you'll want to look at how you're running your campaign and your objectives of how you're segmenting those donors what kind of frequency you want to establish but i would skew to more than less because people tend to think they need to do less social media content when the algorithms on facebook and and those channels will sort of naturally suppress how often you're seen so you need to sort of over post hmm. to accommodate and make up for those algorithms it's about i think it's like a one in five kind of ratio where that they will see your posts so if you're only posting twice they may not see that post at all but if you're posting if you post like five times during that day they may see one of those posts they could see more depending on their engagement but that's kind of the rule of thumb can I ask you a question, Corey? Sure. Does it does it make more sense to spend to spend a little more and put it into Facebook ads rather than boosting posts? Does boosting posts really help? 
Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if we have enough data to sort of say definitively, like, uh, you know, boosted posts versus ads. I think uh, ads are generally better um, mm -hmm. because you're able to target the audiences a little, a little more specifically. Right. Um, that's and what so, I was thinking. Yeah. So, I, I mean, that's, that's where I would lean. Sorry for the, the interrupt. <laughs> no, oh, that's no, great. <laughs> that's great. Okay, um, yeah, keep a keep the conversation here. Okay, so uh, next question I have here is uh, for Pamela again. Uh, so uh, the question is, if I'm sending a direct mail package for year end, uh, when when is the best time to send it? Well, again, it depends, but but most of our most of our students send it between um, November and December. As long as you get it in their mailbox, in their in their mail by the end of the uh, the end of the year, you have to be super careful if you're sending anything bulk because you never know if it's going to sit in the post office. I have gotten letters myself. It's it's really interesting how the at least it is to me how the more that I've become a donor. I don't know if any of you follow the whiny donor on Twitter. But the more I, that I've actually become a donor to so many nonprofits, I probably give to around 100 nonprofits throughout the year, um, the more it's actually informed my own practice. But I have gotten a number of letters after the first of the year that were sent bulk, and I'm sure they just sat in the post office. So you want to be careful of that. If you're using a, if you're using a, a a good mail house, the good mail house, the good mail houses should know that. That's good. That's great. Okay, so uh, really, folks, that's uh, about where we have it. So that's uh, all the time we have for the today. I want to thank everyone. If you have questions that are not answered today, you can email marketing at mobilecause.com. If you're interested in discovering how MobileCause can help maximize your fundraising efforts so you can raise more with less time and effort, please fill out our post-webinar survey or visit www.mobilecause.com. If you'd like to receive Pamela's foolproof year-end fundraising strategy campaign checklist, I love that name, uh, <laughs> click on the link in the chart, in the chat, or uh, in, we'll also have it in our follow-up email so go ahead and check that out and again thank you again for attending today's webinar and best of luck to you in all your year-end giving and, and fundraising efforts we really look forward to seeing you again next month at our webinar on thanking your donors so with that have a wonderful day everyone bye-bye <laughs>